Ever since I was a kid, I've always enjoyed and repeatedly played the Tomb Raider games. Although getting stuck every 10 minutes on a traversal section, a puzzle, or just not knowing where to go or what to do, gave me a hard time trying to beat the game, to where I remember going to a local internet cafe, download a walkthrough of the game in text format, and copying it to a 64 megabytes flash drive, where I'd follow the manual step by step, and I'd still struggle to finish the level. Of course, being a young kid with low cognitive comprehension of information and patterns played a big part in my disability to problem solve and logically interpret game design. But man, even now looking back at those classics, you can still see how obscure they were and trying to beat them as an adult can still pose a challenge. The controls were clunky, but they were accurate and required a strict execution to perform and exceed. The puzzles didn't make sense sometimes, but they had the player to be observant and focused to conclude them. The fights were scary, the pacing had me on my toes. The story was interesting, and most of all, the levels were very unique in their design, setting, and aesthetics. And although they were great games, they had a lot of areas that could be improved upon, especially now with modern technology. Everything from controls and word traversal to graphical depth can be optimized to an immense level with modern tools. Unfortunately, the modern era Tomb Raider games missed the mark with an overcorrection that went a bit overboard. Following the formula of its peers in the modern era games, they started handholding the player and heavily appealed to the newcomers in most of their designs. And even though I still think the modern Raider games are fun and enjoyable, they lost a bit of what made them special in the first place. Instead of accurately executing a jump, now you just press the jump button whenever and Lara autocorrects your angle and momentum. The puzzles can be solved with a minimum mental effort and have dead giveaways voiced by Lara. The numbers on the pillars look like the first half of dates. You show on the left. The level traversal have pathfinding mechanics. The fights are frequent and similar. And even though you can change the difficulty level of exploration, puzzles, and combat individually in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, you can't alter a basic infrastructure that is rooted in the level design. But the fact these options exist shows that the developers still know and care about what the classic Tomb Raider experience is, and I love it for what it is. And on the brighter side, the graphics are beautiful. The set pieces are atmospheric and somewhat large in scale. The controls are responsive and consistent, and the customization includes plenty of options. So isn't there a way to get the best of both worlds without compromising one another? Between the execution and puzzle-heavy classic Tomb Raider games and the visually stunning and responsive modern ones lies a somewhat balanced trilogy in between, starting with the soft reboot Tomb Raider Legend in 2006. The game starts in the Rocky Mountains of Bolivia, to where Lara's old friend helps her locate a tomb of an ancient civilization called Tiwanaku. The tomb houses an ornate stone dais, a mechanism of some sorts that look exactly like the one she saw with her mother as a child, the one who took her mother away after she inserted a mysterious sword into it. And so, in hope of finding some answers, Lara starts making her way through in a flashy intro that sets the tone of the character and the game moving forward, to where she instantly can be perceived in the same fashion as the classic Lara from the previous games. Sassy but confident. It's like going up a set of stairs, only far less forward. Playful but professional. Sexy but elegant. And most of all, a kind-hearted individual that cares about her friends and family, which added a new emotional depth to the character that we barely saw in the previous games, where she had a bit of an anti-hero depiction. It's cold in the mother Gameplay wise, Bolivia feels like a straightforward tutorial level, a great one at that. The aesthetics and the pacing between sections, along with the delicate balance between traversal and combat, paired with cleverly hidden secret items, are all on brand for a Tomb Raider starter pack. It's a bit linear, but it serves its purpose of not overwhelming the player right from the get-go. The story progresses after Lara finds the stone dais where she is confronted by a group of mercenaries led by a man named James Rutland, who possesses a piece of the strange sword her mother used a long time ago. And after referencing that his findings in Peru were aided by a woman named Amanda, an old friend of Lara who is supposedly dead, after getting stuck underwater in a pile of collapsed wreckage years ago, Lara then sets off to Peru to find what actually happened on their mission back then. You see, that mission was to find a quote-unquote breakthrough discovery that shifts the trajectory of the story to a more supernatural approach that is carefully integrated. 
the first sighting of a paranormal occurrence Laura had was at nine years old, where she witnessed her mother being teleported after a climactic sequence of events. But as she got older, the haziness of such a memory affects how dubious the event was and how much uncertain Laura is of the accuracy of the event. That changed in her early 20s where Laura and Amanda went down to that digging site and freed a hostile deity that nearly killed everybody. And fast forward to the present where Laura returns to the digging site and finds out that Amanda was actually able to free herself along with discovering inscriptions about the queen of Tiwanaku and her mighty sword that acts as a key to a specific dais. It doesn't seem like fiction anymore. These events that occurred to Laura and her mother are feasible now, which renders her mission to figure out the origins of this sword and its powers more personal and prioritizes it as an objective. And that's where we arrive to Tokyo one of the most memorable and iconic missions in the game, and resembles a big part of what's missing in the modern games. A big city level that acts as a break from the remote lands we're used to. A nice change of pace that keeps the game fresh and adds a new dimension aesthetically, whether it's blending in a party with an evening dress, climbing onto the side of a building, or jumping between them using a motorcycle, it all has that espionage feeling to it, that blends very well with the opposite side of the coin. And I understand that after Angel of Darkness broke out of the norm a bit too much, the developers tried to go back to that sense of adventure that is more faithful to the originals, but for me I've always enjoyed enjoyed exploring these urban areas. The story goes on after arriving at Toro Nishimura's office, a friend of Lara who set up a meeting between her and another friend of his that goes by the name of Shogo Takamoto, a Yakuza boss, who's stolen and now possesses a piece of the mystical sword that Lara has been hunting for. The negotiation for the sword goes south and Takamoto leaves the property after commanding his goons to finish Lara. And after Lara fights back and takes them out, the rest of the level acts as a tailing mission for the Yakuza boss going through rooftops and in between floors, evading traps and fighting mobs in one of the most beloved outfits in the community. For some reason, we finally reach the showdown with Takamoto, who's now using the power of the sword shard he has as some sort of an energy weapon. The fight itself is pretty straightforward, ascend to the higher platform to avoid the turret's fire and swerve between three main attacks, an overhead beam that you need to duck under, a low one that you jump over, and a vertical one that you stray from. All combined makes for a bit of an underwhelming boss to play due to how simple the design is considered nowadays, but an up-to-date boss that checks most of the marks in 2006, especially in comparison to similar third-person action-adventure games at that time. So, after beating the Yakuza boss and retrieving the fragment of the sword, Lara sets off to Ghana to acquire the next piece who's owned by James Rutland. This has to be my least favorite level in this game. While it checks off all the required boxes for looking and behaving as a Tomb Raider level, I feel like that's exactly why it is so forgettable. While I have enjoyed this safe approach in the first level, Bolivia acted as a gateway and a welcoming to the world of Tomb Raider, which felt right at home, but halfway through the game it gets a bit old. But it's still a well-crafted level that is visually stunning, and thankfully the game does a good job of mixing between classic and experimental levels. That helps keeping first-time players engaged, and after solving some puzzles, fighting some mobs while traversing through these caves, Lara learns that her father was here before, and found a key that can mend the sword pieces together. It's where we engage with Rutland. And I gotta say, as a game that revolves most of its mechanics around exploration, puzzle solving and word traversing, there is not much that can be done in the way of fighting a boss. I mean, it's not like it's Doom Eternal where you're presented with a plenty of combat options that act as counters and reversals for enemy AI attacks. It's a different approach here, and so the best possible design choice that can be implemented to enhance the combat experience is making the environment a part of the fight. And that's what Crystal Dynamics did for all the bosses moving forward in this game, where Rutland and keeps retreating to these platforms that act as a safety net for him. And shooting off the plates that act as an armor for the core of these platforms will expose the core, which can be pulled with Lara's grapple hook to crumble it down. Adding this environmental obstacle is the right idea, but it does make the fight a bit more gimmicky. Going after Amanda next on, we head to Kazakhstan. Is this my house? Answer, please. Where we find her in an old Soviet lab. And after Lara fails to mend her relationship with Amanda, we fight a dark beast that is controlled by her, where we retrieve another sword fragment. This level has that cold and industrial feel to it, which is a bit reminiscent of the Russian submarine from Tomb Raider Chronicles. It starts in a military base and transitions to a command center via a motorcycle section that's a bit detested by the community and for a good reason. Although it is fun to maneuver around at full speed between rocks and lanes, 
and jumping between bridges, it's the combat that feels like a chore to do, due to how random and inaccurate it feels, where I feel like if the developer is focused more on the environmental obstacles and the challenge of traversing them, more than the looped combat segments, it would have been a lot more pleasing to go through. But inserting combat waves in sections of the game that didn't necessarily need them was a way to fill the void of a simple level design that doesn't have much to interact with, which is something that had been improved upon in the modern titles, where the levels themselves have much more space and assets to play around with that negates the requirement of an out-of-place combat segment. Fortunately, the command-based portion of this level is fully tailored to dally in, with minimal out-of-place combat interruptions. It's where Lara finds a map inscribed on the back of a medieval shield that leads to King Arthur Museum in England, the sixth level of the game. This is where Lara finds the final piece of the sword inside a tomb deep down below the museum, grabbed by King Arthur's hands. The museum itself has an eerie tone to it that follows for the rest of the level, but ascending down below is where it gets dark and frightening in old Tomb Raider fashion, filled with horrific traps that can burn, slash, and drown Lara, pulling yourself through dark waters on a coffin while it feels like something's lurking below. And it finally leads to the tomb of the Court of Camelot, that holds King Arthur in some sort of a crystal sarcophagus. The lighting and color palette resemble a sun ray dawning deep down the depths of the earth, a gloomy, enchanting level that reaches its climax with a colossal sea serpent boss fight that's been cleverly foreshadowed with these massive cage traps mere moments before. And after fighting and escaping the serpent, Lara heads back to the mansion, where she figures out that the key to assemble the sword is her mother's pendant, where the last time she saw it was with her mother back at Nepal when she was a child. And after experiencing the claustrophobic dark dungeons of the underground museum, reaching the high snowy mountains of Nepal makes it much more gratifying to tumble on. Reaching midway through the level, Lara finds the pendant key in the wreckage of the plane that she and her mother crashed in years ago. So, after she uses it to reassemble the sword and escape the temple at the end of the level, it's time to head back to Bolivia to insert the sword in the stone dais. Nepal itself feels pleasantly welcoming aesthetics-wise, but plays like a generic action shooter with a minimum amount of detail and exploration incentive. It's at the final section in the temple where the game starts feeling like Tomb Raider again, only for it to be cut short, which can be said about the entire level, as it is probably the shortest level to go through casually in the game, excluding the final level Bolivia Redux, which acts as an epilogue arena fight, starting off with Rutland's mobs and ending with the Dark Beast summoned by Amanda, and after the battle ends, Lara fulfills her mission and inserts the sword in the stone dais, opening a familiar portal. And after a brief encounter with her mother who is seemingly stuck in another dimension, the portal explodes, leaving her mother stuck in Avalon, a legendary island that existed in the past, as she was told by Amanda. The game ends on a cliffhanger after Lara spares Amanda and proceeds to get ready for her new mission, finding and rescuing her mother in Avalon. It's not the most exciting cliffhanger narrative-wise, as it's replicating the same goal we spend the entirety of this game trying to reach. And after defeating a final boss that can be spammed to death even on the hardest difficulty, the game left a bit of a bitter taste in my mouth. And it's not just centering around moment-to-moment -moment gameplay alone, but looking at Takamoto, Rutland, and Amanda as antagonists, they lack the character, the scale, and complexity of villains like Von Croy, Sophia, or Natla from the classic Tomb Raider games. And if we widen the comparison scope to things like hidden secrets, or to even something impalpable like the ambience and the tone of the levels, Tomb Raider Legend falls short in contrast to the classic titles, having otherworldly and unique levels like the floating islands, which is transcended in a mystical, unearthly realm that takes the risk of being experimental, or levels like the living quarters, which takes place in a shipwreck at the bottom of the sea. Strolling between the dark hallways while discovering horrifying secrets and monsters monsters gives a sense of impending isolation. But even though Legend lacks the innovation and the jeopardy the classic titles had, it's not how it should be perceived when playing in it. After all, comparison is the thief of joy. They gonna kill me! I'm gonna kill them! And when the game is being played intuitively without any presuppositions, it's very likely that you'll have a good time. After all, the game is technically more advanced than its predecessors, as the natural evolution of the technology used to develop it. Which can also be said for the modern titles, having a higher graphical depth and animation elasticity. But that's not always the priority when compared to what actually matters. Sometimes art direction and atmosphere are greater than graphical depth itself. Where traversing a detailed, obscure world that's very deliberate in its level design and experience can be far more compelling than just a shy 
shiny coat of paint, and although the newer titles can be entertaining, they lack most of these aspects, and most of it comes from focusing on the narrative and building Lara as a relatable character, which centered the design of the world to go hand in hand with her story and progression as a character, leaving a small room for unchained creative input on the design. In other words, they sacrifice the more open and flexible design for a more linear and focused one. It's a bit understandable considering how much time, effort, and money a modern Tomb Raider would need if it approached its design like the classic ones, scale-wise at least, but it hurts the franchise in a sense of dividing its fans. I mean, if a new Devil May Cry was to be released, I would expect the same combat potential the older games had as a primary infrastructure since it's the main reason why me and most of the people play it. Now, if you want to add more focus on the narrative and character building in Devil May Cry, go ahead, just don't make it at the expense of the combat depth. A good example would be the soft reboot of God of War, where if you was a fan of the older titles and enjoyed their combat, you can still do so at the same advanced level you did in the old ones, arguably even on a greater level, while at the same time you get to enjoy a broader narrative and wiser story progression added on top, where one approach does not compromise the other. The same can be said for Tomb Raider Legend to some extent. While it did abandon certain game designs the classics had in pursuit of others, it was still able to capture the essence of the Tomb Raider experience in a minimalistic way, while adding its own core design to the equation. And with the recent selling of the franchise's assets to Embracer Group, who acquired the modern developers of Tomb Raider Crystal Dynamics, who said that the next game would quote-unquote unify the timelines and combine elements from all the three series, including the work of core design, acting as a middle child between the classic and modern Tomb Raider games, which it sounds like a Tomb Raider legend or reboot metaphorically. Maybe then the franchise will be able to reach the potential it deserves, but until then I'll reside in the digital habitats of Tomb Raider legend.